Well, it's great to see you this morning. We have just concluded graduation and uh, the full scheduled events on our campus, and that's always a a heart-rending kind of week as we have two graduations on Friday with the graduate schools in the morning and Boyce College in the evening. And uh, this was my 20th commencement since uh, being president, finishing 10 years. And I can tell you they get more and more poignant as you go along because as you get to know the students and then you see them leave, some of them, we, we had at least a half dozen students going into very, very dangerous mission fields and full-time service, uh, some of them in the various stands, as they say, in Central Asia and uh, Indonesia and elsewhere. And Just a reminder how God is calling out in this generation an incredible core of Christian missionaries, ministers, church planters that are ready to go out on the front lines of ministry in this nation and around the world. So it's a very moving week for us. And then we get ready for a new crop, as you might say, with over a thousand new students expected in the fall. So it's, uh, it's an exciting time. You can only do these weeks every once in a while because the entire institution is completely worn out at the end of the week. But it's a part of the rhythm of, of our institution's life, and it's an exciting time for the church. We're in Deuteronomy chapter 13 as we are continuing our study verse by verse in this great book. And as we are now in the 13th chapter of Deuteronomy, we've become rather familiar with the way Moses speaks to the people as he is getting them ready to enter the promised land. Moses knows because the Holy Spirit is, of course, inspiring Moses as he speaks and as he writes, Moses knows by also his experience as the leader of the children of Israel that there are certain patterns of temptation that Israel will always be, will be confronting again and again, and there will be a susceptibility for the children of Israel to fall into certain defined patterns of unbelief and of sinfulness that he has on his heart. Moses is, is, is like a general, the five-star general of, of Israel that has led them out of the bondage to Pharaoh and now right to the, the Jordan River where their future lies in the promised land right across the river. But he's not only their five-star general, he is their minister-in-chief. He's the senior minister. He is God's prophet. And that is the word. By the time you get to the end of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is, is declared to be the prophet of God. But he's not only the prophet, he is also their teacher. And he's not only the teacher, he is like their pastor. And you put all of this together, and Moses is the father of the people. That's why they refer to themselves as the people of Moses over and over and over again. Even the Jews today, we are the people of Moses. They are the children of Abraham. But it is to Moses they look, especially the books of Moses, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, to understand who they are as a people. And this is one of those touchstone chapters where Moses warns them about exactly what they are going to face. Now, in chapter 12, you will remember, the Lord God spoke through Moses to say, when you go into the promised land, you are going to find places of worship. And these places of worship are going to be worship altars to idols. And you'll remember Moses said, you're going to find them in the high places because that's where the, the pagans put their worship centers. You're going to find them in the low valleys. You're going to find them between brooks and rivers. And you're going to be tempted to say, look, here's a wonderful place of worship. Why, people have been worshiping here for a long time. We will just replace the worship of that idol with the worship of Yahweh, the one true and living God. And God said, you will do no such thing. You will be tempted to do that, but I will not allow the worship of of me to be confused with the worship of anything else. So you destroy those altars utterly. Even the sacred pillars that are set up, you grind into dust and pour them into the river. You be done with every evidence of this. So don't think you can just go into a land and throw away the idols and worship me. No, I will choose. Remember in chapter 12, he starts talking about the place of my choosing. God says, I'm going to determine how I will be worshipped. You will worship me as I will instruct you. And not only how, but even where I will instruct you. And I'm not even telling you where yet. I'll tell you where when I'm good and ready. 
Then we come to chapter 13, and where we studied last week, we saw in the first section of this great chapter that Moses warned about false teachers who would arise. And in Matthew, excuse me, Matthew, Deuteronomy, chapter 13, we're going to see there are three contexts of warning very much on the heart of Moses. First of all, he says there will be, there will be false teachers there will be religious leaders who will seek to lead you astray. And in the second place, he says, there will be family members who will seek to lead you astray. And then in the third case, he says, there will be community people, your neighbors, who will seek to lead you astray. Now, last week, we looked at the first of these about the false teachers. To remind ourselves, Moses said, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you, and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of the prophet or of that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God, who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from among you. A couple of things to note there before we go on. Notice the sentimentality the very sweetness of the language Moses uses here to refer to how the children of Israel are to stay true to God. Notice this at verse 6. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. Several different components there. You are to fear him. That's the original. That, that's the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That's where we start. And you shall keep his commandments. We understand that. Listen to his voice, and that's just like Jesus, as we talked about in the Gospel of John, referring to himself as the Good Shepherd, says, I'm the Good Shepherd, my sheep know my voice. The people of God are distinguished by the fact that we know to whom to listen. In all the cacophony of voices, we know the one voice we are to hear, it is the voice of God. We listen to his voice, we serve him, and then that precious addition Moses gives, which is characteristic of his preaching, we are to cling to him. Moses is really the first of the major influences in Scripture to speak of God so clearly in parental terms. And just like an infant or a small child, a toddler, a young child clings to his parents, that's the way we are to cling to God. And, and you know exactly what I'm talking about here when, again, you, you see a child reach out with a hand at, 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 or in a time of need and just crossing the street or whatever, you know, the, the, the sign of security is to have his hand in, in his, his father's hand or his mother's hand, and they walk across the street. But this is also the kind of clinging that takes place when, when a child is scared, runs immediately to the parent and clings like suction cups, like Velcro. They're stuck to you. That's the way the children of Israel are to stick close to God. They are to cling to him. Now, notice again the last thing in this passage is that the punishment for one who would lead Israel away from the truth is death. It is capital punishment. And there's some who would say, well, look, that's just awfully extreme. I, I, I mean, it doesn't seem civilized or fair, or, or it doesn't seem to follow any acceptable model of jurisprudence that the penalty for such a thing as this would be death. But remember what is at stake here. This teacher is seeking to lead the children of Israel away from the one true and living God. Israel is the people of God. They are a theocracy. They are God's people. God said, if you depart from me, I will destroy you utterly. Well, that means that this kind of theological heresy is tantamount to treason. And it must be treated with that seriousness, says Moses. In my commencement address... On Friday, I preach in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. And in Galatians chapter 1, in those wonderful verses, 
Paul is writing to the Galatian church about his frustration in the fact that they have so quickly abandoned the gospel. There is the temptation in every generation that the people of God will abandon the gospel for a false gospel. In chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now, there's so much in that passage, but what, what Paul's reflecting here is, in, is extreme frustration. J.B. Phillips, in translating Paul in Galatians 3.1 has Paul addressing the the Galatians with the words, Dear Idiots. That that shows you his frustration, and that's what's what's there. If you look in your tamer translation, like uh, the New American Standard has, You Foolish Galatians. Uh, You can look at Galatians 3.1 and see what your translation has. But I think J.B. Phillips has the spirit of it exactly right. You idiots! How could you do this? And here, Paul is very much like Moses in terms of his concern for his people. But then Paul says this, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Accursed. That's what he is to be anathematized. He is to be cast out. He is to be revealed for the threat he is to the people of God. Now, this is Paul in the first century. You'd like to think, wouldn't you, that the church so close to the time of Christ would have remained absolutely true? You look in the book of Acts as we walked through it just months ago, verse by verse, and you'll remember that when Paul went to Galatia, there was an enormous response to the gospel. There was enormous excitement as persons turned to to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet it appears they quickly turned away from that faith towards false teachings. And Paul says, I'm absolutely amazed that you could do so so quickly. How is it that you, of all people, could go following these false teachers? The danger is always there. And then those wonderful words, Paul said, listen, even if I, an apostle, come preaching another gospel, you anathematize me. If an angel comes with a different gospel, you reject that angel. You see, any angel bringing another gospel is a false angel. Any apostle bringing another gospel is a false apostle. Paul says it's the gospel that doesn't change. And it's the gospel we must protect. In Salt Lake City, there with the center of the Mormon religion and the Mormon tabernacle and the Mormon temple, the top of the Mormon temple, you may remember, there is a golden angel. It is a representation of Moroni, the angel that supposedly, according to Mormon teaching, uh, instructed Joseph Smith uh, the words of the Book of Mormon. It's uh, actually a very attractive sculpture on the top of this very tall building. It's a gilt representation of this angel with a big trumpet. The Roman Catholic Cathedral, the Madeline, as it's called, is nearby, has a big window, and it's right behind the altar, and this window has no option but to have the Mormon Tabernacle's tower right in the center of it with that angel. And you have to give these Catholics great credit because what does it say in that stained glass window? If even I or an angel come preaching another gospel, <laughs> let him be accursed. <laughs> right there. You know, I love subtlety. You know, <laughs> there you have it. The danger of false teaching is so desperate that the church has to be ever mindful. And we are in an age in which there are many people who do not even believe that truth is an absolute and objective reality. There are churches all over this city and all over America who do not believe it is possible to commit heresy because they do not believe that orthodoxy is any fixed thing. But time and time again... The Scriptures speak of, for instance, in Jude, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. It was delivered one time. It's not re-delivered. It's not repackaged. It's not remanufactured. One time it was given to the church. The Apostle Paul, speaking to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and chapter 2, repeatedly says, Guard the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Retain the pattern of sound words. Even the words of the gospel are revealed words. 
even the way we talk about the gospel is to be structured by the scriptural presentation, lest we make of the gospel something it is not. And here you have Moses saying, even if someone arises among you who is a prophet who can perform miracles and signs and wonders, if what he teaches is not consistent with the truth of the one true and living God, then you stone him. So the first threat was the threat of a false teacher or religious authority. But the second threat is from within the family. Look at verse 6. This is very painful to read. If your brother, your mother's son, or your son or daughter, or the wife you cherish, or the friend who is as your own soul, entice you secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, whom, you neither, whom neither you nor your fathers have known, of the gods of the peoples who are around you, near you, or far from you, from the one end of the earth to the other end, you shall not yield to him or listen to him, and your eye shall not pity him, nor shall you spare or conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. So you shall stone him to death, because he has sought to seduce you from the Lord your God, who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Then all Israel will hear and be afraid, and you will never do again such a wicked thing among you. Well, from within the family. See, Moses says, you're going to have to be very careful. Because once you get into that promised land, once you are drinking out of wells you did not dig, and you're eating from trees you did not plant, you remember chapter 6. And once you are filled and safe, you're going to be tempted to go after other gods. And we know that's true. We've read the book. And once you are so tempted, you're going to discover there will even be people from within your own family who will seek to entice you away from the God of Israel. How many times, by the way, did God tell the, the, the men of Israel, you shall not marry foreign wives? Because the moment you marry a pagan wife, you bring her pagan idols into your home. Read the book of Ezra, where so many of the sons of Israel went out and married into pagan families. And Ezra said, God's judgment is upon us. This is exactly why. Think of King Ahab married to Jezebel. Jezebel came in, and by the time Jezebel had set up court, there were 900 prophets of Baal and the Asherah there in Israel. She didn't come alone. She came with her gods, her pagan deities. And the paganism infected Israel. And then we led, of course, to the confrontation between the prophets of Baal and Elijah on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18. The enticement comes. You know, there, there's no more vulnerable place than in the context of the family for disaster, spiritual disaster to come in if someone in the family would lead persons to worship another God, to forfeit the worship of the one true God. Because there's nothing more intimate than the family. There's no conversation more secret than pillow talk. And just imagine Ahab and Jezebel. What in the world was going on there? You know, she was always there to to bring her paganism into Ahab's reign. This past Friday, a young man who was a pastor here in town received his Ph.D., and I can well remember the very first semester when he came. And uh, he came from a church where a very close friend of mine was his pastor. And his pastor called me, and he said, This young man's coming to the seminary. I, I just want to ask you to please pay particular attention to him, take care of him. Because when he told his parents of his call to ministry, his father kicked him out of the house and told him he never wanted to see him again. And he said, he, he is, he's staying true to his call and he's coming, but he's coming without support. I'm, I'm very thankful my parents are here. And I'm thankful to God that I was raised by godly Christian parents. But, you know, there are so many who are not. And sometimes it's the children who would lead the parents away. Sometimes it's the parents who would lead the children away. Sometimes it's a brother who will lead a sister away. Sometimes it's a husband who will lead a wife away. Here Moses warns, and look at how he tries to circle the question here. 
Notice in verse 6, if your brother, your mother's son, or your son or daughter, or the wife you cherish, or your friend who is as your own soul will entice you secretly, saying, let us go and serve other gods. Now, what he's trying to do here is to draw a picture of the family circle. And he says, even if within that circle, within your closest and most intimate associations, there should be anyone who would entice you away from the worship of Yahweh. Do not listen to him. And then again, of course, capital punishment follows because this is worse than murder. Murder, a murderer just kills the body. But here, this one would, would kill the soul. Now, Jesus spoke of this as well, of course. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. It's one of those hard sayings of Jesus that a lot of people would just as soon avoid. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Wow. Jesus knew that the gospel would divide friend from friend and even within the family division would come. And Jesus here says there is one allegiance higher even than blood then kinship, then human intimacy, and that is the allegiance to me. Jesus said, if you will not come to me because of your mother or because of your father or your sister or your brother or for that matter your son or your daughter, then you are not worthy of the kingdom. Because if your earthly intimacies, your earthly relationships, however cherished they may be, keep you from your worship of God and from your allegiance to Christ, then you really are not a believer. You are not a disciple. The parallel text is found in Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Stronger language, language that is sometimes misunderstood. Verse 25 of chapter 14, Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, how many qualify by this? Do you hate, as this instructs us to hate, father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters? And even his own life? You have to understand the Jewish structure of thought here. The word hate here does not mean that Jesus expects us to hate our families. It means by contrast. It's a very familiar Jewish way of thinking where when you love one thing, you must hate all other things. But it's not the hatred of wrath. It means that these things are seen as lesser than the other thing. And that's the logic that's going on here. Jesus is saying, if you're not willing to leave father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters for the sake of the gospel, then you're not worthy of the gospel. Jesus here very clearly is not saying we are to hate our family, but we are to be willing to hate our family if our family would keep us from becoming disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that at the foot of the cross, he in fact instructs John to take care of his own mother. And he speaks of the, the responsibility of, of understanding parenthood and, and the fam, familial bonds. And Jesus even instructs us to refer to God in prayer, praying unto him as our Father who art in heaven. Jesus honored the family. But he understood that the temptation is not that we will honor the family, but that we will worship the family, that the family will become a good greater than any other good. And Jesus warns against that repeatedly as he taught his own disciples. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, the picture is this. A mother, a brother, son or daughter or wife or friend seeks to lead you, seeks to lead the children of Israel thereby 
into forfeiting the worship of the one true and living God and aligning with a pagan deity. Notice the language here. Let us go and serve other gods. Look at the parenthesis. And this Hebrew text is very, very difficult because there are several clauses within clauses. But we, we try to line them out. Let us not go and serve other gods. And then Moses says, whom neither you nor your fathers have known of the gods of the peoples who are around you, near you or far from you, from the one end of the earth to the other end. Now, what in the world is that? That is Moses trying to make very clear this means any other God, any other place, from any other origin, at any other time. <laughs> He's saying God's known or unknown. Listen, we know the Baals, we know the Asherah, we know Molech, we could list all the pagan gods we know, Moses said. But the human ingenuity of paganism and idol making being what it is, you're going to be confronted with gods you don't even know yet. You're going to be confronted with pagan deities that haven't even been invented yet. And they're going to come from one end of the world to the other. It doesn't matter. Have nothing to do with them. It doesn't matter the name. It doesn't matter the origin. It doesn't matter where they come from. It doesn't matter what they claim. Have nothing to do with them. And the one who would lead you to leave the worship of Yahweh, the Lord, and instead to worship these things, this person is as a spiritual terrorist a murderer, a traitor from within, and you are to put them to death. This family relationship is so dangerous. It can be the crucible of disciple-making. That is the promise of the Christian family. When you come to the New Testament and Paul lays out the responsibility of Christian parents, we are to raise our children in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. We know that from the Old Testament. But Paul also lays out how the family is to be ordered so that it becomes a laboratory for disciple-making, such that children see in their parents the love of Christ and will desire Christ as they see Christ being worshipped and served by their parents, even by brothers and sisters. Within the family, there is an awesome, an incredible, an unprecedented opportunity. You realize now that the statistics tell us that if a young person does not come to make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ by age 19, they will be in the 4% of Christians who make a decision later in life. That's an incredible statistic. But that is to say that m most Christians make their original profession of faith in Christ by age 19. I think that's like 75%. And then there is another 20% before age 24. And after age 24, I think it's only 5% of Christians today. And evangelical churches indicate that they came to Christ after age 24. So you see how important childhood and adolescence are in the making of disciples. Because in those tender years where the big decisions of life are being made, that's where there's a real openness to hear the gospel. That's why youth ministry is so important. Because if you do not reach these kids at that age, there's a hardness of heart. There's a, a settled-in lifestyle without Christ. And we're certainly not saying that older persons cannot come to Christ because even in this room there are persons who came to Christ as adults later in life. It is to say that there is, statistically speaking... A very clear pattern that if, if persons at a young age are not exposed to the gospel, they are much less likely to respond in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we have a warning that the family can not only lead to Christ and, and to the Lord, but away from him as well. So here we have Moses giving us two different contexts we've seen already. There is the danger that a false teacher, a false religious leader, spiritual leader will arise, and he may even have a charismatic personality and the ability to do miracles and signs and wonders, but if there's some other gospel he's preaching, then let him be anathema, or even worse, as you see from Moses, you put him to death. And then in the second context, in the intimacy of the family, it just may happen that someone within even your family will seek to lead you away from the Lord. You cannot tolerate that. But there's a third context, and that's the community. Look at verse 12. If you hear in one of your cities, which the Lord your God is giving you to live in, anyone saying that some worthless men have gone out from among you and have seduced the inhabitants of their city, saying, let us go and serve other gods whom you have not known, then you shall investigate and search out and inquire thoroughly. 
If it is true in the matter established that this abomination has been done among you, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying it and all that is in it and its cattle with the edge of the sword. Then you shall gather all its booty into the middle of its open square and burn the city and all its booty with fire as a whole burnt offering to the Lord your God, and it shall be a ruin forever. It shall never be rebuilt." Nothing from that which is put under the ban shall cling to your hand in order that the Lord may turn from his burning anger and show mercy to you and have compassion on you and make you increase just as he has sworn to your fathers. If you will listen to the voice of the Lord your God, keeping all his commandments, which I am commanding you today and doing what is right in the sight of the Lord your God. The first context was a false teacher. The second was temptation from within the family. And here you have the defection of an entire city. The picture is this. Here is Israel. The conquest is over. They are in the promised land. They have cast out all the peoples from before them. The Lord has given them victory in all the cities. They've taken over the walled cities. You remember how the spies came back and said, the, the walls are all the way up to the sky. There's no way we can defeat them. They have the cities now. They're comfortable. That's exactly what Moses was talking about when he said there's going to come a day when you're going to be living in cities you didn't build, drinking out of the wells you didn't dig, eating from the trees and from vineyards you didn't plant. When that happens, there's going to be an additional danger of seduction, even defection. The picture here is of people who will go from one city to another. And, and in this city, they will, they will set up a false teaching. And the city will tolerate it just a little bit. But before long, it's like a pestilence that has come inside the city wall. It's like an infectious agent. And before you know it, the agent spreads from one family to another, from one individual to another. And before you know it, the entire city, which had been worshiping the one true and living God, is now a city filled with pagan altars and with pagan... Uh, idols and with the paraphernalia of pagan worship and their hearts are no longer serving the one true God, but instead they're serving this idol. And remember that the cities were very important. That meant that this city then becomes a magnet. That city then becomes a traitorous city within the children of Israel. That, tr that city can no longer be depended on to fight for Israel, for the children of God, but is now joined the other side. Moses says, if that were to happen, this is what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to treat that city just as you treated the Canaanites you had to cast out as you entered the land. You notice the wording is exactly the same. We've seen this before, haven't we? Because Moses said, when you go in and you take these pagan cities, this is what you're going to do. You're going to destroy them utterly. You're going to, to take care of everything that is there. You're going to leave nothing that was there before. And, and even the booty, the gold, and, and the things of value, you're going to take them into the center of the city and you're going to burn them because you can't even have pagan paraphernalia. You know, that's a warning to us, isn't it? You see, we like to think that without giving ourselves over to paganism, we can use pagan paraphernalia. And here we're warned that that is a very, very dangerous thing. You can't just take a golden idol and melt it down into a cross and say, look, we've improved it. No, you just got to get rid of it. Because that, that thing represents such an abhorrent, an abhorrent offense to God. It can't be fixed. It just needs to be destroyed. And Moses here said, if you have even one of your own cities that should act in this way, you have to treat that city as if it were a Canaanite city and destroy it utterly. When you look at these three contexts, it's clear that even though these were addressed to Israel as they are about to enter the promised land, we face the very same dynamic, the, the very same temptations. In the church, we have the same danger. We have the danger of false teachers who have charismatic personalities or, or they come in and, and they can perform signs and wonders and they come in with an up-to-date gospel that they have made more relevant for the day or, or they come in with a gospel of easy believism or you turn on the radio or the television and you see the health and wealth gospel and that stuff will sell because people want to be healthy and they want to be wealthy. And you can see the seductiveness that takes place there. And you can see people just drawn to that. And, and it's hard to believe sometimes. 
I think I've told you this before, but I was called by a reporter some time ago, and he said, I'm doing a story on faith healers. And he said, I want to get your opinion on this. He said, do you believe in faith healers? I said, no, I believe in faith, and I believe that God heals, but I don't believe in faith healers. And he said, why not? And I said, because I've never met one that was 400 years old. You bring me a faith healer who's 400 years old, and I'll have to rethink my theology. But as it is now, they tend to die right on schedule. You know, because health and wealth tends not to be what they promise it's going to be. You know, you, you do this and you'll be healthy. Well, they're, they're aging right on schedule. The danger of false teachers is always there before us who mistake or misconstrue the gospel for something it is not and teach some other gospel. The church must be ever vigilant about this or the church will find itself something other than the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You may keep the name church. On Friday, I talked about the fact that Martin Luther in the 16th century said, look, these false teachers will come in and they will use our same words but turn them into something other than the gospel. They'll use words like God, Christ, baptism. They'll, they'll use words like gospel, but they'll make it into something it is not. Do not be confused by the words. Listen for the gospel. The second context is also important to us because there are families today who are torn apart by the gospel. And there are people today who do not come to Christ because they know what it would cost them within their own family. And that is a heartbreaking thing to see. But it's not new. And there are even family members who will lead persons away from Christ. And thirdly, there is political community pressure as well. And we certainly live with this today. We live in a nation that was once Christian, not legally or constitutionally, but certainly in terms of the majority worldview that was in place in the society. The worldview without which our entire constitutional order and legal system and everything else is incomprehensible. But now we live in a place where it's considered odd, an eccentricity of our history, that these weird people once believed such weird things. And, and yes, our secular society thinks there may be some pockets of resistance out there that they haven't gotten with it yet, where there are still Christians, but as long as we keep them marginalized, we'll be all right. And so you have the press every once in a while awaken to the fact that evangelical Christians are here, and it's one of those National Geographic moments where they all of a sudden, look, that tribe still exists. We thought they were wiped out. And they're still here, little pockets of them here and there, little tribes here and there. The political pressure is acute. We are now living in Canaan. That's the bottom line. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the 21st century in North America is living in Canaan. We are living with foreign gods all around us. We are living with the gods of secularism and the various paganisms all around us. And the church is tempted in this generation to shift its allegiance to something else. And again, they can use the same words. They can use the same symbols, but make them into something that is an anti-gospel. Now, we are not a theocracy. We are not Israel. You'll notice that the instructions in the New Testament are different than the instructions in the Old about how we are to confront false teaching. Paul's instruction and the instruction of Jesus, as is found, for instance, in Matthew chapter 19, is that you as the church take responsibility that when a false teacher arises, you anathematize him and you put him out of the church. That's different than putting him to death. Because the church in this age is not given the power of the sword. We are not the government. The body of Christ in this age, between the coming of Christ and his coming again, is a pilgrim people. And that's why when Peter writes to the church, he writes to the strangers and aliens scattered throughout Pontius, Bithynia, all over the world. We're resident aliens. We are to respect the law of the land insofar as that law does not prevent the worship of the one true and living God and does not prevent the gospel. But we do not have the power of the sword. We do not execute persons. The problem, though, is that most churches do not ever excommunicate persons. That is the power given to the church, the power of the discipline of truth. We are to take the truth so seriously that we would not allow false teachers in our midst. 
If someone is teaching another gospel, they must be, Paul says in Galatians, set out from the church. The church has got to declare to itself, listen, this is what the gospel is. This is what we're going to teach. This is what we're going to preach. If even Paul comes here preaching another gospel, we're going to put him out. The church lacks that kind of conviction in this age, at least in many circles. And we follow through with the family. We do not put a rebellious son or daughter to death, nor do we put to death one who would lead us away from the gospel. But Jesus said, you must realize that there's a higher demand, a higher calling, even than the calling of kinship, the calling of family, and that is the calling of Christ. You must be willing to set aside even family with all the heartbreak that is there involved for the sake of the kingdom. And the political pressure is there too. If we can't stand the political pressure, then we're not really standing for the gospel. And the political pressure is only going to get hotter, ladies and gentlemen, you know that. The pressure is, is going to become more and more acute in years to come. That's not the word of, of Al Mohler as a prognostication. That's the word of Scripture. Where the Scripture told, tells us it's going to get worse and worse and worse. That, that's what we should expect. And we can certainly see some of the lines of the tightening resistance all around us as it's clear that a secular society is increasingly frustrating, frustrated with us and, and perplexed by us. When I did CNN last Saturday night, the reporter was absolutely astounded that evangelical Christians would take the gospel into Iraq. That's just rude. That's intolerant. That's like medieval. Well, no, it's not medieval. It's older than that. <laughs> But that's the gospel. That's our assignment. And, and the fact that we would live the way we live and teach the way we teach and witness the way we witness to the world, that's just a perplexing thing. But it's not only perplexing, it's subversive. You know, the world has to hate the gospel. It's not indifferent to it. And that's something we must continually recognize. The opposition between the world and the gospel is not a small thing. It's the whole thing. Because when the world is really ordered according to the world's wisdom, and the church is really ordered according to Christ's wisdom, those are two incompatible wisdoms, two incompatible ways. Now, when the church is worldly, and, and when the world is preserved in a context of even residual Christian influence, this is what we have in this country, is residual Christian influence, then sometimes that opposition is not as clear as it is in other places. For instance, in communist China, where it's absolutely illegal still constitutionally to believe in God. But when you actually get the world on the world's terms, and when the world is honest, and when the church is faithful, there is an absolute opposition. That's why Jesus himself spoke to his disciples and said, you are the children of light in the midst of the children of darkness. And you say, well, that's awfully prejudicial language. Well, that's Christ's language. The church is the children of light in the midst of the children of darkness. The problem there is that the church sometimes takes on shades of gray. And that is exactly what Scripture disallows. When Moses was getting the children of Israel ready to enter the promised land, this is a briefing of sorts, like a military briefing before a major military operation. It is a spiritual preparation for the children of Israel. And when we come next week to chapter 14, we'll be looking at how even the dietary code of Israel is to set them apart from the peoples around them. You see, you're going to be able to tell who is the follower of the one true God by how he eats. And you say, well, that's awfully eccentric. Well, it was a way of demonstrating we're a different people. We live under the Lord and that means even the way we eat is going to be different. There are things we do not do. There are things we will not eat because of our allegiance to God. It really isn't so much about the food as it is about the witness. Now, we as the church are not called to the same kind of witness. Now, Peter had that very graphically demonstrated to him when on the rooftop of the house of Simon the Tanner, you remember, he received the vision with the great sheet with the four corners let down with all the animals and said there's no clean or unclean. So we can now eat just about anything, and obviously we do eat just about anything. Because it's not a matter now of our witness, but you know what? If it's not food, it's something else that is the church's responsibility. And that is to live by the law of Christ 
such when the world looks to us, it isn't so much what we eat or do not eat that catches their attention, but what we do and what we do not do in the midst of a culture that is ready to do anything. But that's next week, and we'll look forward to gathering together until then. Until then, may the Lord keep you safe, give you great opportunities for witness, bless you, and, and allow you to bless others. Let's continue to pray for our family members, uh, for Frank's mother as she is struggling with this diagnosis of cancer, for Judy Reitmeyer and others who have continual fights uh, with this disease and, and with others who uh, have needs known and unknown. It's a privilege for us to pray for each other. And, of course, it's a privilege to be able to come together to study God's Word. And uh, I pray the Lord will ground us in this Word that we will be conformed to the image of His Son. Yes, Ruth. That's right. What a week this is going to be for her with the primary on Tuesday. Uh, one of our sisters in Christ, and uh, we need to be praying for Rebecca. And uh, this is one of those difficult things in the middle of a political contest to know how to figure everything out. But we as Christians are called to be discerning. And to have that, that to responsibility of discernment is an incredible thing. And uh, I'm very thankful that we have in our own midst a woman who stands for righteousness has been willing to take a public stand and uh, pay the penalty for that. And one of the things that's so interesting is that uh, we know her not only as a church member, but as one who faithfully teaches uh, in a special needs class and has for so long. And I want to tell you the best thing about Rebecca Jackson about this, and I, I do not mean this as a political statement, but as a statement among us as believers. If she does not get the nomination for governor, it won't be the end of the world for her because she doesn't live for this as if this is all there is in life. Uh, and and, and that, that's a very, very safe and sane place to be in terms of the Christian worldview. And uh, we need to pray that the Lord will give her great strength and courage during these days. We need to pray that the Lord will show his mercy to this commonwealth by ensuring that the one who was elected our governor will be a person of great integrity. Let's pray will be a person of faith, a person who will lead in righteousness in an unrighteous age. Thank you for reminding me of that. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are so thankful for how you bless us in ways that we are not even fully aware. But Father, even in our awareness, we know that we would not be where we are today but by your grace, and it's in your grace we stand. Thank you for the grace of your word, your revelation to us, this gift which is so precious. Father, may it be used in our lives in such a way that we are conformed to the image of your Son, that the world would see in us what they themselves would desire. Faith and